gentlemen. Yes, welcome to Subversion Hour, episode two, everybody. We have got a really special guest uh, with us tonight to talk about all sorts of things. This guy, uh, a personal friend of mine, but he's uh, actually the only intelligent friend of mine. Did I just say that? No. <laughs> Hey now. He's an amazing I hope, guy. I you hope guys, nobody else is listening. I keyed, I keyed. <laughs> you guys um, will will love him, uh, Adam and Jeff, and also the viewers. Adam, please introduce him. Yeah, we've got <laughs> Doctor Valley, who's a professor at a college and a, a deist and a badass motorcycle mechanic and just a really smart guy. We're going to talk about atheism, Marxism, deism, transgenderism. For all you out there that uh, Environmentalism, get triggered, religion. yeah. So uh, please give a warm welcome to Doctor Valley. Yeah, welcome, welcome sir. Mike. Thanks for having me, you guys. It's a pleasure. Awesome. Our first question for you, Mike: How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> I've heard, I've heard that in the media recently. Yeah, yeah, let's talk. Let's talk about that. Let's jump into the environmentalism, which I think is a new religion there's a bunch of new religions happening up out there socialism marxism environmentalism and transgenderism there's just what how, what are your thoughts on environmentalism let's start there well well let's see well i i think uh concern for the environment is perfectly healthy and laudable uh i do see in the modern age in a sort of uh in the secular west that environmentalism environmentalism is sort of filling in a certain void in a lot of people's lives. Um, there's a, hmm. I've noticed there's something like a kind of a religious piety that surrounds it. Um, sometimes it does strike me as perhaps getting into religious territory when it's taken to extremes. It does concern me a little bit because um, the the claim is made that everything that the environmentalists believe is purely defendable by scientific empirical methods. But as a movement, it's a normative movement. It has an ethical dimension to it. And when you get into ethics, you're starting to leave empirical science behind. Mm -hmm. And so when science does its thing, that's fine. But how we respond to that information, that's that's a normative question that has to do with values, morality, is and oughts and rights and wrongs. And I think what happens with the movement a lot is that it sort of conflates ethical questions with scientific ones, puts them all together into one unit, presents itself as um, as science as such. And then if you have any questions about any of the sort of uh, the way it uh, prioritizes things, uh, whether those priorities be uh, ecosystems, human needs, um, energy production, uh, then they'll call you anti-science if you have any questions about how they're prioritizing things, and they have a tendency to prioritize the Earth itself as if the Earth itself is the highest locus of value, period, so that everything must be in service to this um, this thing, which is the ultimate good. <laughs> but I think it, it tends to, like I say, it's it's good to have environmental consciousness, but I think the movement is really starting to mate itself with collectivism as a kind of ideology, and it has a lot of religious uh, intensity about it that is concerning me. It's like the vegans got bored and decided to change it up a little bit. <laughs> Become more militant. Right. I got tired of talking about being a vegan. I'm going to start talking about the environment. <laughs> I do know some vegans who are quite responsible in their veganism. Veganism can have that, I think, that element of like ritual. Right. So humans, I think humans are ritualistic animals and they really like ritual. And one of the things that we see in religions, whether it's Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, is they have dietary restrictions. Mm -hmm. And then when you're in those religions and you, you conform to the dietary restrictions, it really makes you feel like you're a part of this greater whole to have that discipline to do that. And I think veganism has that element in it. I wouldn't say that veganism is uh, a religion as such, but it has a certain ritualistic tendency to it, which for some people can get a little highly conspicuous, but I, I do know some vegans who are chill, but it is true that some vegans do have a sort of yeah. intensity about that too, for sure. Yeah, if you want to be a vegan for health reasons or personal reasons, whatever, that's great. If it works for you, great. Shut the fuck up about it. If you want to be an environmentalist, go get a fucking Toyota Prius and stop talking about it and do your part, right? <laughs> the problem oh, is, yeah. it's, with, with it being a religion now, proselytizing is oh, yeah. part of that component. 
Yes, and, and it's it's gone, sometimes with environmentalism, it sort of goes even beyond proselytization and starts to mate itself with the state, right? And once it well, that's the new God. Yeah, once it makes itself with the state, then it's almost as if you have a sort of quasi-religious intensity being made into state power. I'm thinking about that um, that Greta Thunberg uh, mural that's going up in downtown San Francisco. Mm. Um, that kind of thing starts to blur the line uh, with just a simple activist position and something that's beyond that. You know, now you have this huge face sort of staring everybody down and watching everybody and making sure that those people don't sin, you know. Yeah. You know, I was curious, Michael, what you think the reason for young people's penchant for totalitarianism is. Where does that stem from and how does it sustain itself? Here we go. Well, uh, I'll, I can give only my own opinion. You know, I was watching a video from someone I know that you may enjoy, uh, Christina Huff Summers. Oh, yes, very much yes. so. She said, young people tend to mix two powerful things, which is, which are misinformation on the one hand and moral enthusiasm on the other. And when you put those two together, yes. you, get, you get that sort of activism that really characterizes, you might say, a college age student. Indeed. I think people are lonely and they're looking for a some kind of group to join and a cause to be a part of. Absolutely. Of I, I, I do think that most people do have some desire to be in connection with something greater or higher. I don't think everybody does, but I think most people do, and they're gonna find it. They're gonna find something. And yeah. the planet uh, in 2019 is a great place to, or a common place to find it. Um, it could be God for a lot of people. It could be ecosystems. Um, it could be the revolution. But as long as you feel like your daily life and your daily rituals and motions are focused on something above and beyond yourself, you feel meaning and meaning. I think is I think people need meaning almost as much as they need food. Yeah. Well, I think in a culture that has become so myopic and vapid, that is what people are looking to is that external, you know, finding a place to belong. And that's why we're seeing, I think, the you know, the, what I dubbed the secular evangelicals. They've got the original sin of whiteness that you must self-flagellate at the altar of social justice and, you know, repent and else you're going to be, you know, considered a heretic. Where do you think that starts and what do you do you think that universities or professors even are culpable in, you know, in, in, in promulgating that? Oh, yeah, that's 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 oh, there's a lot going on there. Uh, <laughs> you know, I think it, when you look at these movements, I think this, you, I think you tapped into this idea of original sin, okay? And this idea of original sin is a very, very old idea. It's got a lot of history in Christianity and so on. And I think a lot of just, you know, hardcore atheists really have some sense of wanting to find this thing in other places, uh, other than perhaps Adam and Eve in the garden. Um, so some of them will see it uh, that you're you have original sin simply by being born a human and you're a parasite on the earth and now you just got to spend the rest of your life flagellating yourself and you might say sacrificing yourself to this thing so that you can assuage all of your guilt and so on. Uh, you also have the original sin of being, being of being born white, which is a powerful thing that uh, I've seen for a long time. Uh, Immutable characteristics. Immutable right. characteristics. Being born male is another good one. I mean, I'm a big loser, and I think all the other three are <laughs> total losers. Right? We're all in trouble. Uh, and I think How dare you? Guilt is a powerful emotion, and if you feel guilt for the way you were born with your immutable characteristics, boy, I tell you, you will go to extremes to get rid of that, clean that guilt off of you. It's, it's, a, it's a profoundly powerful human emotion to have. Yeah. And if you don't feel the guilt... You get called what bigot or something, or you're anti something or something. And then, yeah, yeah, you better just, better start virtue signaling on Facebook. Yeah, yeah it sort of well, that's the, your original sin. Yeah. And that's why I think that it's important to blaspheme the sacred cows of today, and oh, to let them know that you know what they hold of value may not. It's kind of like what Ben Shapiro uh, says a lot. With he never references the Bible. He never references 
God whenever he's debating someone, because that is a place of authority. And if you don't see that as being a place of authority, then, you know, it's a moot point at that point, And you're just kind of butting heads and, and it's pointless. And, you know, I think that's an, an important thing to do when you're when you're discussing these topics. Yeah, yeah I think uh, ultimately the one authority that we can all agree to, regardless of whether, whether we're atheists or theists or whatever, is reason and logic. You know, and you have to make that appeal. Now, you had mentioned uh, to what extent do professors play a role in all this. Um, you know, it's a little bit of a long story, but I'll give a, a quick kind of idea about that. You know, this Marxist ideology that sort of dominated the past uh, the past century is extremely powerful. I've studied it a lot. Uh, it really was probably the single most um, passion. In my opinion, I would call it a religious ideology because it had so many religious elements in it, but it was atheistic, right? And the right. hope uh, the hope and the dreams that uh, Marxism and communism gave to people were so powerful. They had all the power of religion entirely. But what happened was in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, you had a group of Marxist intellectuals from Frankfurt who escaped Hitler, and they came to Columbia University, and they were called the Frankfurt School. And then they started up a school of thought called critical theory, and they they made some alterations to classical Marxist theory. Um, if I have time later, and if we're interested, I'll get into them, but I, I won't get into them too much now, but the certain alterations they made had to do with, instead of, instead of changing, you might say, the way we relate in the production process in order to transform society, they started to focus on what they call superstructure rather than um, means of uh, relations of production, they start, which is classical Marxism, let's focus on that. They started to focus on superstructure, which would be religions, norms, traditions, customs, um, uh, art and music and so on of your culture, and then start to, you might say, um, critique it and sort of um, criticize it and undermine it so that the working classes could become class conscious and and then open their minds up to the anti-capitalist revolution. So that that was in the 30s 40s and 50s and this this started in higher education it started at Columbia University it started to hit professors you know because intellectuals have always been fascinated by communism um, marxism leninism the ideology of the soviet union they're so attracted to it they got interested in what the, the moves they were making and it started to work its way down like trickle down um trickle down socialism i suppose you could say right yeah. And, you know, it gets into the universities, the colleges, the high schools, the junior highs. And now the whole culture is reeling with these issues that came directly out of the Frankfurt School of Critical Theory. It's affecting religious organizations that you would never have believed would ever be affected by it, as I'm sure you know. Uh, but in <laughs> Hinduism, <laughs> Hinduism and Christianity with atheists, I mean, with deists, they're yeah. all splitting into camps about what yeah. are we going to do about tribalism the yeah and very few people know its origins yeah. but it does have origins in what i would call neo-marxism or a, a modern take on marx so what's well, so you, weird to, no go ahead john but if you have a point on this go ahead because i'm not going to something no else. i was just going to uh, just just real quick say that the self-awareness and those who are kind of pushing these ideas seems to be lacking simply because the people that seem more about communism and Marxism would be the first people lined up and put in the gulag. <laughs> That's oh, yeah. all I wanted to say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. When you look, when you look at uh, today's scene, right, and you have a lot mm -hmm. of uh, like alternative se sexualities are a huge part of the current uh, discussion. Exactly. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. When I look at, when you look at the Soviet Union, okay, and the way they did things there, okay, um, they would never, for a moment have tolerated it for a second i mean the right. soviet union was totally and entirely heteronormative um they would give women awards who would have a lot of children because they were serving the needs of the working class and the proletariat um it was expected that you would marry and have a lot of children and the state wanted you to and they would reward you for doing it it was entirely yeah. heteronormative um, homosexuality was an absolute scandal in the soviet union um, I'm not saying I agree with that or anything. It's just that's what it was. Right, right. And so, if you were to like, if you were to take sort of Marx or you know Lenin, if you were to take Lenin today, right, and you you plopped him into the United States today, I think he would be very much 
Like what in the world is going on here? Because this is not how he would have been thinking about anything. So a lot of stuff's happened in the past 100 years in all kinds of amazing ways. But I think you're right. If, if you had a really hardcore dictatorship of the proletariat, I think a mm -hmm. lot of people who helped it to happen would be in a lot of trouble. Uh, I have Indeed. no doubt about that. <laughs> so you've painted this, this excellent image, the tree of socialism. Where do you see it going from here? Do you see it coming to America full force? Or what, I mean, I'm curious what your opinion is as a professor dealing with the younger generation. Wow. Wow. It's, it's kind of hard to say. I mean, these ideas are really mainstream with younger people. Um, that's for sure. On the other hand, though, there are, you know how, you know how young people sort of have that sort of, by nature, that sort of rock and roll thing, like you want to give somebody a hard time. You just got to give somebody a hard time. It's like sure. when they ask, uh, uh, when they ask, uh, so what are you rebelling against? And the guy says, uh, what have you got? Okay, so there is, with some young people, I am seeing a little bit of a, a kind of a, a rebellious pushback against PC because PC is kind of the man now. You know, and, and mm -hmm. I don't think anyone can deny that. If you go to a, any college campus, okay, except maybe um, Liberty University or something, or, or so, there may be a handful of campuses, but every other campus you go to it, and essentially the left, and I don't mean the liberals, I mean the left, because I want to make a distinction there. The left are basically the man. Um, their orthodoxy is the default orthodoxy, and some students are kind of rebelling against it, so it's kind of hard to tell where it's going to go from here, especially in the United States, because the United States has proved a lot more resilient against collectivist ideologies like this. Yeah. But it's really cracking, though. It's cracking. Maybe maybe we can um, find out where it's going to go from here if we find if we dig a little deeper and find out where it came from. So my my question to you is because you mentioned desire earlier, you mentioned meaning and hopes and passions and dreams and whatever. Now, <clears throat> on an individual level, <clears throat> it is perfect to have those feelings, to have those yeah. hopes, to have those dreams, that meaning in your life um, and that desire for things on an individual level. And, that, and individual levels can, you know, actually move into having other people of like mind around you that have these thoughts too, which is all well and good in itself. But what is it or where did it come from? What made it this group think thing where they have to infiltrate, like you said, organizations and cause these organizations that once stood up for something uh, and then completely flipped around when these social justice warriors entered the scene. I mean, is it a, is it fear? Is it fear like with this PC thing? You know, you, you can't say this and you can't think this and you can't write that because I mean, what, where did it come from? How did it start? Where did I, th I think it stems from fear. Do you agree or is it, did it come from something else? Well, it's sort of, if, if the question is kind of really general about why do humans in general feel like they want to be a part of a group and so on, or if you think, or if the question is more, where is this more modern thing starting? That's know? where I, this more specific, the, this, yeah. this yeah. thing, this, this monster that's reared its ugly head, like, okay, wh yeah. where did it uh, come from? Maybe we could see where it's going to go if we find out where it came from. You know, you know, how did, how did it that. infiltrate? I think I can riff on that. When you take a look at sort of uh, the left and the right sort of broadly conceptualized, one of the really deep, you might say, if you, you, you know, if you go to the roots of yeah. why they disagree about stuff, it has to do with human nature. And one, uh, some people believe human nature is really sort of flexible and malleable and you can uh, affect it radically and you can actually change the nature of the human. Um, and that would be more that would be more on the left right and then the right has a tendency to view humans as they're sort of pessimistic about their nature it's kind of like flawed right out of the gate and it's pretty consistent and there's really not much you can do about it because people are always going to be kind of flawed so you start with that and then you add on that the need for meaning so if you believe that humans are metaphysically you might say uh sort of flawed and they and that's just the way they are and that's going to be the way they're always going to be you're not going to be attracted to a utopian ideology that says we can change humanity right here and right now. You'll, you'll be more resistant to that. On the other hand, if you think humans are really malleable, then you might jump on board with a movement that says we, we know how to do it. Like the Soviet Union wanted to create what it called Soviet man, who would go to work, not for money at all, because at a certain point there won't be money at all. He'll go to work because he just wants to make everybody else happy. And that'll give them more joy than any other motivation in the world. But I just see, I just don't, that's not human nature to my mind. 
never going to happen. Altruism, right. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's just not the nature of the human. I, I do have a kind of a stable view of the nature of the human. But also, in addition to that, I'd like to add something I got from Dennis Prager on the radio. <clears throat> he, and he talks about the hierarchy of human needs, right? And he says, okay, number one is air. Number two is water. Number three is food. And you might think number four would be sex. Uh, humans have a really strong desire for that. But he actually does an interesting twist, and I thought it was pretty insightful. He said, it's actually meaning and then sex. Okay, meaning comes before sex because there are people who you know might not have sex, but they have a subjective sense of meaning and they're happy with that. <clears throat> and on the other hand, you have a lot of, you, have, you can have someone who has a lot of sex and who's miserable. So I think that meaning thing, if you, if you understand that the need for meaning is between food and sex, and you realize how important that is and that human nature is stable, then humans are always gonna be starving for this stuff. Now in the modern age with religion, which has traditionally served that, that uh, need in the humans, whatever the religion is, you know, and in the secular West, it's really been undermined to such an extent. And the deist, uh, speaking of deism, the deist played a role in that too. But at a certain point, people are sort of floating around and they're unmoored and they don't feel any sense of connection to anything above and beyond themselves. And so, but they need something. So they'll go for the planet, they'll go for the collective, they'll go for humanity as an abstraction, as that higher power, so to speak. But I think when we when we worship humanity as an abstraction, I think that's when we get into trouble. That's when people get killed. You know, that's what communists did. I think we need to look at humans as individuals, right? As radically individual. And if we have that orientation, we can avoid, you know, tens and tens of millions of unnecessary deaths. Anyway, uh, have a nice day, everybody. <laughs> I was going to say, <laughs> yeah. people in power would choose the uh, the most profitable of all, which would be, uh, you know, as we all know, the, the LGBT thing right now is the most profitable going on. You look at corporate America, everybody slaps a rainbow flag on their product and there you go. Yeah, that's, that's quite a controversial topic. Uh, yeah, but to throw out the baby topic. with the old bathwater just so you can get some new bathwater, it's like, what, yeah. isn't that? Well, I'm, I'm heartened to see, as I'm sure that you, you three have seen, that there are uh, members of LGBTQ who are nevertheless individualists, right? Like Blair White. Like Blair White. I really like Blair White. Um, and there are a lot of other people starting to pop up on YouTube like Blair White. And they're doing a lot of good stuff. And for me, that dynamic there, that, that individual, okay, individualism versus collectivism, I think is really a deep decision that has to be made when you're deciding how you're going to approach life and politics is you got to make your decision, which one of those is going to be, is going to have priority, you know? You know, I'm curious, Michael, something that I'm noticing a, a phenomenon would be to criticize a movement is viewed as criticizing the individual. And, you know, it, it's kind of like if you, or, or for example, if you criticize Antifa, you must be pro-fascist. So where do you think that breakdown comes from? Oh, that is a very disturbing development. Uh, a, a great example of that is, let's say that you're studying Islam, right? And you're critical of some of its teachings. Maybe you've read the Quran or studied Islamic law or the, the life of Muhammad. And there are things in there that you think should be uh, talked about. And if that's once that's interpreted as that you hate the people in that community, and I think that's what this identitarian political stuff is doing. That's when stuff gets toxic because, you know, here in the West, you had, look, we're, we're quite accustomed to this. You can read the Bible and you can criticize it all you want and you can just tear it up. I mean, you can literally tear it up, right? In the United States of America, literally tear it up. You can film yourself tearing it up. You can do it on stage uh, and entertain crowds. And you're, going to, yeah. you're going to be safe. You're going to be all right. You might have some Christians yes. upset that maybe you're going to be in trouble in the afterlife. But it, but if you did that with the Quran, you see, uh, that you're taking your life into your hands. And that's just, I think that's just an objective fact. And, you know, what's happening on the, what I would call the left, is that, you know, we've got commitments to freedom of speech and we're accustomed to those. And we like to be able to criticize any old religion we like. 
We like to talk whatever smack we like, but they have that competing value of you may not criticize anything that this particular community holds dear. And now what's happening is you're, you're, getting, a, you're getting a pretty hard tension that's there and that tension is not sustainable. That's what really concerns me is right. we, we have the right to criticize any doggone ideological or religious idea we please because we're nothing's free. above reproach. Right. That's, that's right. right. That's right. right. That's that's sacred but, stuff. Yeah. And there's also a flip side to the coin that, that, that Jeff mentioned earlier. Um, you know, it's not about just, you know, uh, insulting or going against or criticizing the a certain community and you're going against the individual. There's also a thing where, you, you know, you if you don't like a certain individual, for reasons outside of the communities he belongs to, he or she belongs to, you are all of a sudden labeled as someone that's against that community that they belong to, just because you're against an individual for separate reasons. That's right, and that's bad news. And that those are the, I mean, these are the things that are getting people fired, thrown Mm -hmm. out. Uh, oh, it's just uh, they lose it, you know, you're not gonna bake this cake, because you don't wanna bake the cake, you're gonna get your business shut down. Like. Something's really weird here, and you'd think that certain organizations that stood up against and in rebellion of those types of group think uh, would 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 stand up and say something. But they're folding; they're they're, they're crumbling right under you know at their feet. Yeah. It's a social pressure that got to the point where it's starting to become legal code. Okay, and when it starts yeah. to hit legal code, man, it's uh, that that's some heavy stuff. Hmm. Uh, and, and even, speaking, even speaking myself as a non-Christian myself, um, I supported the right of the baker not to make the cake because, look, I, I w- and I would, I would let me appeal to you might call the leftists on this point. If if a Muslim baker refuses to make that cake, are are you going to come down on that Muslim baker with this kind of ferocity? I mean, this man, I mean, this man has suffered. Okay. He has suffered, and he continues yeah. to suffer, and he's going to be treated like a demon by a large swaths of millions of people for the rest of his life as a demon. Ridiculous. And I'm just thinking, well, but you know that it, I, I don't know if they fully realize this, but homosexuality is not acceptable in mainstream Islam. I can't emphasize that enough. It's right. against the law, okay, normatively, and it always has been, and it's yeah. got a punishment that's capital. So death. Yeah. yeah. So the expectation that, you know, that the Muslim community would, you know, be happy with making these cakes and celebrate LGBTQ, you know, they're, 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 what they're doing is this comes from critical theory is you might say it's a coalition of the, the victim groups, right? <laughs> the, the oppressed or exploited groups. And then you build them into a coalition so that they can um, develop a new consciousness and then get that sort of class consciousness that occupies the left from Marx so that they, they're ripe for revolution. But uh, some of the groups that you bring together, they don't have common interests. And those interests could be, in many cases, incredibly destructive uh, to a lot of people. So we have to, I think we need to keep this American system we have with this radical freedom of speech, which I think is really healthy. Is we start enforcing <laughs> one of these victim groups sensibilities onto the general population, it's just going to, I mean, it's already horrible, right? We've yeah. all dealt with it. It's already really high. But you it's see, there's a, there's a thing going on, like, uh, for, you know, there's trying to strip away our Constitution, you know, when you mentioned free speech, um, and the Second Amendment, too. Like, there's gun-free zones. Yeah. That's how they start. They start with, the, One, this area, two. you're not allowed to have the guns. Now, criminals aren't going to pay attention to that, so you're actually dumb for doing something like that. Because now you opened up yourself for attack, and you can't defend yourself. And nobody can and then you have this thing where there's hate speech. Now, it's, it's free speech. I can say whatever the fuck I want about anybody at any time. I could face consequences because there could be some physical altercation, whatever. But you have the right to say whatever you want. And now they have this thing, well, now we have laws. Now you can get arrested for hate speech. That's unconstitutional right there. You, you may have seen the polls that have come out in the past couple of weeks about the attitudes of younger people toward the First Amendment, where uh, at least half are willing to put limits on it for the sake of the hate speech stuff. 
So, and those are the first and second amendments to our constitution. And they are just, I just consider that sacred stuff. We can't be messing with the first and second amendments. We have to be really clear on defending those. I question their intelligence. I think there's a lot of stupid people out there. Yeah, and I also question the moral sense, the value structure of a lot of people who are coming out against the first two amendments. It's deeply disturbing. You know what it is? The older generation, I guess I guess we're all kind of old now, but we need older people who are a little wiser and who've lived a little bit to yeah. to temper youthful uh, revolutionary enthusiasm. You know, yeah. age is wisdom. You know, and we got to have the power to be able to say, just chill out here. Yeah, there's this thing I feel like is <laughs> is a sin to me personally, and that's forgetfulness of past orthodoxies. So. They, what these young kids are doing are playing, you know, their Xbox or on Instagram and all this. And, and and I don't know if this is what the makers of these things wanted was to keep them busy and keep them don't don't, you know, do what you normally would, like read a book, learn about something in the past and see that these things that are coming out are just repackaged shit that's already happened and failed, like drastically failed and, and at the price of of people's lives. You know, and these are like, yeah, well, we want this, and we want universal health care, and we want this, and we want that. It's like, it, just just read a book, just look up anything about the past that has this already happened, and and see the results already. You're not going to want what you're crying to want, you know, if you, if yeah. you just open your mind and and, and the book. Michael, I'll if I could, uh, oh, go ahead. In reference to the, the the Christian Baker, for example, and you know, this is kind of a hypothesis of mine. I think that attacking Christianity, for example, is not brave because you are attacking a group of people whose entire philosophy is turned the other cheek. So I see it as low hanging fruit. It's kind of like when, you know, black metal bands are constantly putting burning churches on the front covers of albums until you put a mosque on the front of that that album. You know, I I don't have I don't lend any credence to what you're saying, because in 2019, it is it is no longer brave to to. um you know, criticize Christianity. So what I see with the the Christian Baker is, and, and perhaps this is your contention, is that no one has a right to another person's labor. And that's kind of what it boils down to. And that's why, you know, the Constitution should and does protect him. How do you, do you see that as well? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, remember, uh, we were we were all there. Remember the 80s, right? And then you had, uh, you know, you had uh, those bands coming out, you know, that were, you know, saying all kinds of harassment <laughs> stuff, you know. And it, it was pretty edgy and, and, and so on. At the time and, it was, yeah. And at the time it was, you know. In 2019, okay, so you're going to, you know, you're going to say all kinds of really harsh words against churches and Christians. It, it, it's fine. Um, a lot of people do have a moral or intellectual problems with Christianity, and that's fine, and they should do their thing. Um, deists have had those too, and certainly atheists do. But you're right. I don't. I don't see courage in it, uh, especially in the West. I, you know, it's it's not like wow, you're such a tough guy. <laughs> I mean, but whether Islam deserves a criticism or not, it's it's a fact that if someone were actually to be in a big band and write stuff like Slayer and Venom or were writing about Christianity. Exactly. And we start saying stuff like that about Islam in 2019. It would be so much edgier than anything these um, these black metal bands were doing in the late 80s. My goodness. Well, we're someone a, doing that. We're going to have a guest <laughs> on probably in the next couple of episodes that's actually doing that. So oh, I'm sorry. trying to announce that little teaser. <laughs> I, I, I'm scared for this person because... He's not. Oh, don't be. He'll fuck you. <laughs> that is, I believe, in objective reality. This is this is serious stuff. It's not a joke. And I'm not, you know, look for anyone who's watching this video. I'm not. I don't, I'm not saying that everyone in a particular religion has this attitude and so on. But what I am saying is something that I think everybody knows is true. You don't go in the public or make a video, a music video, or put out a public release that's talking like that and think that you won't have consequences from somebody mm-hmm. for that. That are very serious. Okay, yeah. That's all I'm there's, saying. There's a lot of people out there with, you know, mental dysphoria and things like that. So they'll, they'll yeah. do crazy things because they don't know any better. They, their mom and, and I, dad didn't teach them. I, I would also like to say too, I, I, as it's clear, I'm I'm kind of critical of the left. And what I would say is, I think the left has this idea that somehow uniquely, 
Christians um, have problems with their ideas, okay? Maybe religious Jews, and they have that sense. And so they look at the other religions as sort of allies. They might conceptualize Islam as an ally, Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, Confucianism, Shintoism, and so on, paganism, and whatever. But when you take a look at, you might say, pious or dedicated members of any of those religions who are sort of traditionalist or conservative in their religious views, those are consistently running into issues with leftist ideology, uh, regardless of the religion. It's not, it's not as if Christians are the only people running around, just the folks at your local fundamentalist evangelical church are the only ones who have a problem with whatever you're doing. My goodness. <laughs> Uh, you go to India, you go to Pakistan, you go to you go to uh, uh, Japan, you can go to anywhere. Deeply religious people typically don't like that move because okay? they have this tendency to agree that human nature is pretty stable and it can't just be changed by political movements in any radical way. That you have to do something else. The human needs something beyond political movements and activism. They all tend to agree about that, whatever differences they may have with theology. <laughs> yeah. Oh. 100%. I, I, I mean, if you look at whoever has the cultural power at the time, which in the 80s, the Christians did, that's why they, you know, had more sway in their arguments. And in 2019, we see who has the cultural power at the moment, and that's who's going to wield the sword. Well, it reminds me of the, the Who song when he says, uh, uh, meet the new man, same as the old man. <laughs> yes, you know exactly. <laughs> yeah, we saw it in the eighties with the satanic panic. Mm. Yeah, I was so there. <laughs> and the parallels today are obvious. Oh, yes. so obvious. And, and quite frankly, if you kind of look at it objectively, I think what we're going through today has more staying power than the satanic panic had. Agreed. You know, satanic panic was kind of like a kind of a white hot short burn there. But this thing here is a long, deep burn. It's deep and it's long. And it's, uh, I don't know, I, I have concerns about the long term on it, you know? Even when you think well, about yeah, something it's... like a, even when you think about like the, the Salem witch trials, you know? Um, that was pretty bad stuff, but it was quite short and localized. Yeah. But we have here right. a really deep burning thing that is really demonizing people all over the place. I mean, they're not just demonizing fundamentalist Christians anymore. My goodness, they're demonizing just essentially anybody who has any issue with anything that they're doing. And you all get lumped into the same group, you know. Even Satanists. Isn't that weird? Group with you, you know? <laughs> yeah. it, makes, it makes for strange bedfellows, you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You see, oh, you're my friend in this right now? No way. I can't believe that. <laughs> well, that's why you're seeing libertarians and, you know, even liberals and conservatives kind of joining forces right now, you know, to fight against what's currently, you know, going on. I'm seeing it. Oh, man, I am seeing it. I'm seeing it with atheists. I'm seeing it with pagans. I'm seeing it with heathens. I'm seeing it with Hindus. Um, I'm seeing it all over the place. A lot of people, it's kind of like a lot of people are starting to, you might say, coalesce around sort of like really exalted sort of Western values, Western history, regardless of the religious um, affiliation. They're like, there's a lot of stuff that we live with that I think we've taken for granted for a little too long. And now mm -hmm. that it's under attack, we're starting to notice it's actually pretty awesome and it always was pretty awesome and let's keep it going and don't let it go, you know? Yeah. You know, you've mentioned deism a couple of times. I'm yeah. not real educated on that can you give us a little bit of clarity i think before we go into deism i think we i, just, I think what we should do is lead up into how he became okay. a deist because i oh, think we should start geez. back i mean you wrote your dissertation defending atheism yes i did so if we could start there and then we'll move into uh things because i know after that you uh you were looking into other atheism things like like satanism you read a lot of levey you know a lot about levey so let's start with the, the origin of that and then move into how you came into the deism thing, if that's if that's. Well, fine. I can give you a pretty quick sketch without getting too long-winded. Uh, so when I was uh, like 18, I was raised essentially kind of without religion generally. And then when I 18, 19, become a philosophy major, what are you going to do? Well, you're going to become an atheist, of course. So I did that. Uh, I was pretty excited about it. Um, then I started up um, an atheist organization at my university, which uh, still exists today, 30 years later. And... 
and I had amazing meetings. You know, we would have debates with Christians and atheists. And <clears throat> my largest one that I held had 700 people in attendance. Uh, this is before the age of the internet, so I, don't, I don't, can't throw it onto YouTube or anything. But yeah, so atheism was a really big deal for me. I explored all kinds of atheistic worldviews. Um, then I became just fascinated by worldviews more sort of more generally. Um, I was fascinated by evil and whether or not evil was logically compatible with uh, God's existence and so on. Then I wrote a dissertation defending the atheist perspective on that. Then eventually I sort of changed my mind. I was reading some deist stuff. Um, over time, I, it, it took about 10 years to make that move, but then I started to, and I was actually, I have to tell you, I was hanging out with Hindus, okay? Because I am a pretty open-minded guy. Um, even though I'm not a leftist, I, I don't I don't think that a lot of my critics can really- well, You said you're open-minded, we get it. I'm yeah. very open-minded, yeah. Hanging out with all kinds <laughs> of different cultures, different worldviews. Yeah. Eventually came around to deism as a sort of intellectual commitment, and I also do rituals, uh, spiritual practices as a sort of addendum to my intellectual commitment. And deism is the belief in a supreme being who created the world, but does not interfere with it by way of miracles, broadly speaking. And it, it, it yeah. does, there are some of the founding fathers who were deeply influenced by deism. I think it's fair to say, Thomas Jefferson, I think most people would agree was legitimately a deist. Um, uh, Thomas Paine was definitely a deist. There's no question about that. Benjamin Franklin was clearly influenced by the deists, but he's a little more complicated. In his autobiography, he essentially quotes almost word for word Lord Herbert of Cherbury's formulation of deism that he had written hundreds of years ago, almost word for word. But Benjamin Franklin may have been moving towards Christianity later in life, so I don't, I'm not going to claim him if there's controversy about him. But anyway, so deism had a lot of influence amongst at least some of the founders. And so my deism is is for me an intellectual commitment as well as a commitment to important people in our history who made the greatest country the world has ever known you know there's a lot of wisdom with a lot of those deists you know i think yeah. so would you consider deism to be theistic deism is theistic in the broadest sense of the word theism um, okay. theism is uh, defined as a belief in a god or gods of any kind in its broad sense and theism and deism, those two words were used interchangeably until the 1600s in England, when that distinction started to happen between the ones who believe that God does miracles and the ones who don't. So more specifically in the modern age, if you say I'm a theist, I would assume, okay, you believe in a God and you're, you believe God has performed miracles. Sure. And if you call yourself a deist to me, I would think at least until you tell me otherwise, you believe in a God that the God does not perform miracles in the modern sense. Interesting. Is, uh, does Ossetru fall into deism? I know like polytheism with Ossetru. That's a great question. Um, I've talked to a lot of Ossetru are about this, so if any of our viewers don't know what that is, it's kind of, it's like European polytheism, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, European polytheists, heathens, Ossetru are, they have a lot of variety of opinions. Some of them believe quite literally in the personages of gods and goddesses. And some of them will believe that the gods and goddesses will actually respond to them and sometimes interact in their lives. Other ones believe that they're persons, but they don't interfere. And other ones believe that they're more like archetypes, archetypes or something like that, more metaphorical. Um, you could definitely be a sort of, you might even call it a polydeist, you know, you could say, um, I believe there's a multiplicity of divinities, but I don't think they're interfering in this material world in which we live, but they're doing whatever they have to do, but don't expect them to do something directly in your life that would violate, you might say, the laws of nature. And that's, I, I would say that view is pretty common with Al Sutruar, you know, like a polydeism maybe. Okay. We're actually seeing a lot of the heathenry symbols actually um, banned in a lot of places too. The, oh, the black yeah. sun, for example, um, is one. Yeah, in Europe, it's really it's really complicated over there because, you know, there are some, you know, legitimate racists who use that symbolism, and that's well known. But to use the symbolism does not in any way mean that you're racist. In fact, a lot of um, people who use that symbolism are anti-racist. So 
But, you know, in Europe, they're, they always had that ghost of, of Hitler and the Nazis around, and they're really hypersensitive about stuff over there. I mean, there was even a video, I don't know if any of you saw it, of a, uh, I think it was a German woman in the subway. She had her hair braided in a traditional way, and she was questioned by the security about her hair because there's a sense amongst a lot of, you might say, activists over there that if you wear your hair in a traditional braid, that that could be a sign that you Lord forbid you have <laughs> yeah yeah. Hmm. yeah so it's uh, it's hypersensitive over there it's very very uh well the symbol, symbols have been hijacked by oh I yeah guess, I don't believe in evil too much but just just you know the assholes of our history I guess I'll say <laughs> I mean yeah right. symbols a lot of different things Hitler. to a lot of people yeah but it the swastika is uh, a part of uh, Buddhism you know. Yeah. And, yeah, as and a matter of fact, if you, go to a Hindu, bit. Yeah, it, if you go to a Hindu temple, okay, and you see a you see a picture of Ganesh, the elephant god, he yeah. uh, is very frequently shown with his hand open, and you'll almost always see a swastika on his palm. Yeah. You know, it's been, it's been yeah. around forever. Yeah. There's a house here in my town that was built prior to Hitler and his regime that has a, a brick inlay swastika above the front door. Hmm. Now, I, I would say maybe maybe it could be fair to say that what distinguishes Hitler's swastika is that little, <clears throat> like, 45-degree tilt on it, mm. which you don't see too much in the Eastern religions. Usually, they just have it straight up, you know, but Hitler, yeah. Hitler, that, little, that little twist on it, you know? Yeah. So I would say if I saw the twist on it, I might ask a couple more questions just to be sure, you know? Yeah, and then there's, I mean, there's other, other groups and things, like there's something called... Uh, something temple or something but they they took a satanic symbol and then they made it political activists it's no longer satanic you know it's like <laughs> they're stealing everything there's groups out there that took the rainbow a fucking rainbow and now you can't use a rainbow without without it being something else you know it's crazy they automatically have a monopoly symbols. right yeah yeah i mean the rainbow if you think about the rainbow's history just think about the religious history of the rainbow okay you go back to genesis right and it's the symbol of God's uh, promise, promise to humanity to the... never to flood the earth again. Mm, you, go, right. you go to the heathens, and actually it's the, the bridge that connects the world of gods to the world of men. As Pink Dark Floyd. Dark Side of the Moon <laughs> album. <laughs> the prism. Absolutely, the prism. I mean, the rainbow is such an amazingly powerful thing. And what's kind of happened in the modern day is, you know, anytime you see a rainbow now, you're just thinking... Okay, political movement, and whether you support it or not, that's what you're going to be thinking. Political movement. And I'm guilty of, and I'm guilty of doing the same thing. You know, when I see certain things, I I start, you know, prejudging the person before even speaking to them. Yeah, because you know, ancient symbols, when they're sort of appropriated for political reasons, mm -hmm. I think it's, I think, I, don't, I just don't think it's right to just humanity in general. I think you know, if you got a, you got a new, unique thing that you're doing, you know, make a unique symbol for it. But, you know, of course, what people want to do is, you know, obviously, it's kind of human nature. You want to take something that's got a pedigree to it, you know, and it's mm -hmm. already really powerful. And then if you can sort of. Exactly. It, um, yeah. And it's it's I, I think it's unfortunate. I, I I don't know if I'll get into trouble for saying this, but I sort of kind of wish that the rainbow was just a rainbow. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, I could just yeah. see a rainbow and enjoy the color spectrum and not yep. have to be thinking politics one way or the other. I don't want to think about it good or bad. I just don't want to think about politics. Yeah. You know, when I see a classic symbol, you know. Yeah, yeah. I agree. <laughs> That's sad. Professor Valley, you know of our past affiliations with the Church of Satan, the three of us, and you know why we've resigned. Um, I'm sure you've, you've read recent essays from their administration and seen what's happened. I'm just curious what your thoughts are on all of this, being well-versed in Satanism. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Let us, let us know what you think about that. Well, you know, um, uh, as someone who was never a member, I wish not to tread <clears throat> onto that ground. But I would say that the philosophy of LaVey, generally speaking, has always really interested me because it, uh, uh, especially on the ethical plane, I see three influences. And I would actually like to see what you guys have to say about it as people who know more than I. Yeah. So I think there's, uh, 
So there's three influences. The first influence I see without a doubt is Ayn Rand. Okay, radical individualism. Ayn Rand was an egoist, and she thought that your sole uh, moral obligation in life is to serve your own rational, long-term self-interest. And if, uh, but she, remember, she called her philosophy objectivism because in ethics she's an objectivist, which means she does believe there's a such thing as right and wrong. And she would say that if you ever do anything willingly and knowingly that opposes or that is in contradiction to your own rational self-interest, you've done something that's objectively immoral, right? So she, she's okay with using that kind of language, right? Right and wrong, moral, immoral, and so on. The, uh, there's, the other two influences are uh, what's called subjectivism in philosophy or more, rash, more sort of logically called individual relativism, which is X is right means I, the speaker, approve of X, and X is wrong means I, the speaker, disapprove of X. And sometimes I get that vibe from him because I did read a lot of his stuff. So, so sometimes he seems like Ayn Rand, sometimes he seems more like a relativist, and Ayn Rand's not a relativist. And then the third influence is more like a nihilism, which is there is no such thing as right, right or wrong at all, and that any moral statement like X is wrong simply does not correspond to anything in reality at all. It doesn't correspond to my preferences. It doesn't correspond to my self-interest. It doesn't correspond to anything. That would be like a, a pure nihilism. So uh, over, over the many years I've read them, I was trying to, you know, I like to put people into boxes. I like to categorize stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, okay, is he ultimately an egoist? Is he ultimately a subjectivist? Or is he ultimately a nihilist? Did you have See, any thoughts on any of that? You're, you're, here's the thing. You're trying to put, a, put Bruce Lee in a box. You can't. He's like water. He'll, he'll take the shape of the box. He'll, he'll, he'll spill into other boxes. LeVay is, to me, the Bruce Lee of philosophy and religion. He took is it, is it, is the best this? parts of these of these philosophical, uh, you know, houses, I should say, and yeah. or thought processes, and and took what was great for him as an individual, as a Satanist, and put it into one area and stripped away the inessentials. I think that it's hard to say, well, he's this and he's that. You can't you can't do it. There's some things that are just mm -hmm. not like mustard. You can't nail it to the wall. <laughs> it's it, it takes the shape of many things and, 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 and is something that's, like, you know, unshapeable, you know? It's just... Would the idea be something like this, that he, that his particular take on philosophy would be this? If this, you might say, uh, serves my, my power, my manifestation, I'll go with that. If it begins to fail to do that, I'll do this then. You know, absolutely. Indulgence, not compulsion. Works, yeah, I'll roll with that if it works. You do what works, and if it stops it's working fluid, for you, fluid yeah. and ethics a little bit. Yeah, you do what yeah. works for you, and if it doesn't work any longer, you move on. You do something else that that works. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I definitely see the Rand. Uh, you know, the, the Nietzsche subjectivism. Certainly, uh, I definitely see. As far as a third, there's there's that definite Machiavellian you know, sense of like when I read The Prince that I see throughout LeVay's work as well. Um, so those are the three that I initially think of would be Rand, Nietzsche, and Machiavelli. Okay, cool. So you're so, going to uh, need a really big box, Mike, you know? Yeah, well, I guess so. <laughs> but you know what? But I'm going to cause a little trouble. Okay. If his attitude is whatever serves me, I go with at the moment. So if egoism serves me now, and if nihilism serves me now, then what's guiding that change, that's his ultimate locus of value. My self-interest. Is the guy an egoist? Is he just an egoist? <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes. Oh, John, you just... Whatever the situation calls for. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I do have because I think, out. yeah. No, I was just going to say, you know, with him talking about your own subjective universe, and you know, operating within that, you know, depending upon whom you're interacting with, might determine whether or not you behave a certain way. I think being too much of 
pigeonholed in one particular way can get you into some trouble when you're dealing with, you know, a certain type of individual that, you know, doesn't receive that well. Hmm. So I see him wearing many masks in many different types of settings. And I have to do the same thing, you know, in a professional setting as as yourself or, you know, if I am, you know, hanging out with friends late at night, um, you know, doing something. So it's that constant chameleon aspect, but also at the same time being true to yourself and not losing yourself in that. Yeah. So, Mike, you never answered uh, Adam's um, questions about, you know, because I know you you keep up to date on things uh, with, in regard to Satanism. Do you, like he asked you about the, the latest essays coming out of the, out of the, uh, Oh yeah, did that, you did you, that, did you, did you uh, notice branch. I got to that? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I did so well. That's no. okay. I don't mind being put on the spot. Um yeah. well Yeah. Uh, as an academic, as as a you know uh, Yeah, well you know, sort of in, in, in the picture of worldviews, it's a little hard to fully know what's happening there. And I think it kind of ties into what I was just saying. Is it, it kind of, there's there's this question of rights that happens. And so in the essays, the recent essays, I'm getting a sense that there's a right, a concept of rights coming out of there. Um, and then the question becomes, well, what are those? And that leads also to when I was reading Anton and he was talking about, you know, um, sexual behaviors. And he said, there are certain sexual behaviors that a Satanist never, a Satanist never participates in, right? Which would be obviously, um, with all credit to him, unwilling partners, children, and animals. Right, right. Because <laughs> they can't consent. And so what I notice is is there's kind of like almost an implicit recognition of something called a right there, but he doesn't use that language in all fairness to him. And then when I read the recent essays, there's also sort of an implicit sense of a right happening there. And so then the question becomes, well, is there such thing as rights? And are the rights that to, uh, to which Anton was obliquely uh, referring natural rights? And are the rights that are in recent essays more like sort of rights by convention? Okay. And so, is so then the first question is, are the rights at all? The second question is, are the different types of rights? And the third question is, which types of rights ought we be respecting and which ones uh, do we take more lightly? You know, and I think that's. That's kind of what's happening there, and I, it's, uh, I'm kind of just as someone who's a system guy, I'm trying to figure out like what's uh, fully going on there. But yeah. but one thing I I, I definitely have concerns so, about, and I, this is concerns that I have in religion generally, is to avoid contentious political topics, because I think that the human being is a political animal, as Aristotle correctly observed, but I think the human being also needs that other side which you might call spiritual or religious or whatever, that really should be untainted by that and should never touch that so that you can do this, but you can still get together with people like this, right? Like, like yeah. say, say you're in the COS or something, right? And then you all get together and you do some cool stuff or you're a heathen or a Christian or whatever, you all do some great stuff and you got some lefties in there and some righties in there, but you're all there th doing this, you see. And this is like a sacred space where we're, that, that this stuff does not come up. Okay, and it's like forbidden. We're doing this and we're all loving it, okay? And then when we leave, we can do that and we can give each other crap on Facebook and have a good old time with that. But then when <laughs> yeah. we do this, drop it. And right. so I, I really, uh, for me, there's a general uh, priority for any religious group to never take contentious political issues and make them ever a part of what it means to be in this spiritual or religious group. And that, that I would say that's a general concern I have. Okay, so in a in a nutshell, what you're saying is that the recent art, the recent essays, and and a lot of those essays in the past, you know, couple of decades here, um, aren't really levee esque in nature. Oh, John, you just you're I, you're just great. Um, <laughs> you like to put me on tough spots. This is the subversion here's hour. Say, here's what I'm going to say. I would say this. I can certainly understand why people would have concerns. Okay, so I might be taking it a little bit out of context from what you said, but rights as an individual, yeah. 
as, as, a, as a Satanist by reading the tenets of the Church of Satan. Uh, rights as an, as an individual, of course, we should be pro rights as an individual. Rights as a cause? No, that's a slippery slope. That's how you generate a protected class and drive a wedge between people who are individuals, who think as individuals. Well, you know, I, I do a lot of... Um, uh, you might Something say, LeVay would probably never do, but go ahead. Right. <laughs> well, I do uh, religious rituals with heathens pretty frequently, and the great thing about that is uh, there are definitely some people at those rituals who are righty, and there are definitely some people at those rituals who are lefty. But we are, understand that when we do this ritual for the ancestors and so on, uh, this isn't going to come up, and it's not going to come up during the hour before we do it, and it's not going to come up the hour after we do it. And everyone really sort of has to agree on this, that we, we can't um, take what we're doing here and then you might say support um, any particular candidate or support any particular cause that's fashionable at the moment sure. or, or oppose it for that matter. It's like, right. we're, not, we're not talking about that here. This is this time because humans are multidimensional. This is, this is my general critique of the left is the left politicizes everything. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if you think about the hippies, right, um, they were being influenced a lot by the critical theorists and what I would call ideologues. And this motto came out of the 60s, the personal is political, right? The personal is political. That came out of the hard left. And I think that's a very toxic idea because what they do is they tend to reduce the whole human experience, the whole human psychology into politics, and this is why everything's being so politicized by um, the left in the modern age. Like, you know, it, even just a few years ago, sports were safe, right? Football, basketball, baseball, it's all safe. And then all of a sudden that got politicized. I mean, you can, the, the, the rainbow's incredibly politicized. Sports are politicized. Everything's so politicized. And I think it's very important for any important religious or spiritual group to just refuse to do that, just yeah. adamantly and consciously. I mean, especially in 2019, you really have to sort of consciously do it, you know, because yeah. it's always impinging on you all the time. And you get the sense that if, well, if we don't come out in support of this or that, uh, then we're just, we're just evil. That's what's happening. You're just evil. <laughs> You're not fit for civil society, you know? Or you need money, you know? Yeah. Well, that, well, sure, that too. But, but I, I, I never diminish anyone's, uh, ideological influences. Uh, some people are very ideologically driven and I don't think money even really is involved. Um, it can be, but some people are really ideolo ideologically driven regardless of money, you know? I think also the, the left seems to lack an understanding that nature is hierarchical and that within nature, there are winners and there are losers. So I wanted to actually get your opinion on kind of your thoughts as I think I kind of most likely understand what you probably, how you feel about this, but I want to ask rather than assume the nature of equality of outcome versus mm -hmm. the equality of um, opportunity mm -hmm. and where you see that stemming from and, you know, how you see that playing out. Yeah, I'm definitely on the side of equality of opportunity and I do never demand equality of, of results. Uh, mm -hmm. Demanding equality of results is just an absolute recipe for complete disaster. When you take a look at the human orientation to the world, you really do have to make a decision. Is it going to be, you know, you got these kind of these poles, right? You got liberty on the one hand, inequality mm -hmm. on the other, and you cannot have, you can't have liberty without inequality, exactly. because that's in the nature of things. And you can't have equality without crushing liberty. It's just in the nature of things. And mm -hmm. I would say as a critique of the worldview of a lot of, you might say, revolutionary leftists, what I would say is, okay, so the, here's the story, right? So there's, there's no God and humans are purely a product of an evolutionary process, which rewards fitness to the environment and punishes lack of fitness to the environment. Okay. So that's, and, and we're, you know, and that's, that's the story. But strong survive. If, if, if that's the story, where, where does this whole everything has to be exactly the same coming out of that story? I mean, evolution. Because if you, you know, yeah, teaches that exactly, exactly. It doesn't, <laughs> doesn't right. teach that it's normative that every critter um, has the same results. I mean, that's it's so wildly contradicted by the nature of 
of the history of evolution. So I, I think what's happening a lot of times is you get a mix with the hard left. I, I don't want to lump everybody on the left with the hard left, but with the hard left, you get the sense of, I think you got like, com, uh, like attention and worldviews. You got an evolutionary story, which actually does, does not have, give you any sense of where these norms are coming from. But then you right. have these norms, I think, that are actually sort of inherited from religious uh, ideas and sort of twisted a little bit. And those are over here, and you got those from this other place. You didn't, certainly didn't go, get those from natural selection. Mm -hmm. That's not where those came from. Those mm -hmm. came from some religious ideas. And then you got, but you got this story over here. And if anyone doubts this story over here, then he's, a, he's an anti-science creationist nut job or something like that. And, but then you got this normative value system over here, which doesn't match up to that. And then blammo, you gotta, you gotta kind of like nail them together. And, and anyone who has any problem with either one of them, because that person senses any kind of tension between the two, you will is just dismissed as anti-science or immoral or evil or whatever. But th it. there really yeah. is a tension there, you know? Is, well, yeah, when you dehuman, yeah, when you dehumanize <laughs> someone also that gives you complete carte blanche to do whatever you want to them. Yes. What, what I would say is, especially following the Soviet Union, is what the Soviet Union and the communists did was they, norm, they, they normatized <clears throat> certain logical fallacies. So the, mm. those two fallacies are ad hominem and straw man. So the idea is what you do is you misrepresent your opponents in wild ways and you don't feel a thing about it. And then what you do is that's the straw man part. And then the ad hominem part is if you come from a class of privileged people, which of course I am, I'm white, cisgender, straight male and all of that. I mean, I'm not a Christian. So if I were a Christian, I, you, you might as well just turn the camera off right now. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, it's like, so you got, you're doing all of your intellectual work on this ladder of hierarchy and oppression. Mm -hmm. And then if, if you're supposedly okay here, then your views have no merit. But if you're down here, then your views are supposed to be taken super seriously. But that, that's just the ad hominem fallacy, but it's, it's normative. It's actually, it's sort of expected and almost morally required of you that you engage in this fallacious argumentation. You know, and it's, that's why, that's why um, the hard left is so anti-intellectual because they're, nor they're normatizing logical fallacies. It's really uh, troubling to me. And then of course, what happens when you do, when you take logic out of the equation, Logic is like a, you might say, some um, Western imperialist construct that's being used to oppress people. Well, if logic leaves, all you have is force. Now what you're going to get are you're going to get people with masks on their faces. They're going to start throwing chairs through windows. They're going to start lighting stuff on fire. Okay, that's what you're going to get when you have actually abandoned reason as some hegemonic tool of the oppressor class. You know, this is, these are the things that concern me so much. Yeah. Well, it's so weird, too, that the people that claim Very to be concerning. one with nature, you know, oh. stray so far from it <laughs> and oh, try to meddle in its affairs. <laughs> oh, oh, I, you know, I did a post on Facebook recently about hunters. OK, I'm not a hunter myself, but, you know, hunters, when you look at hunters, they, they have a lot more connection with nature and their local ecosystem than someone living you know in the city in san francisco has ever had and this guy's actually taking a gun out and he's shooting animals and he's and you know there's a really there's a like a deep spiritual connection that most hunters have with what they're doing and they're being dismissed as just redneck flyover country um gun nuts but they they have a lot of stuff to offer to people and, and a lot of their insides are just sort of just trashed and it just I, it, this is not going in a healthy direction, you know. Uh, you know, uh, balance in life, you know. When a hunter shoots an animal, they use every part of that animal. Uh, me as a garbage man, I see so much waste. I see rotten meat thrown away every day. I mean, that animal died for no reason to be thrown away like that. I mean, yep. How can you yeah, say and, anything bad about a hunter? And if yeah, well, if, I mean, think about this too. If the shit hit the fan and we're flung into a dystopian society or something. Those people that are complaining about those hunters are going to be the first ones to ask for their help. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Yes, that's that's true. I think there's people who really understand nature understand that nature actually isn't um, entirely beneficent, right? It's not all loving. Right. Um, you not just have to watch that show Naked and Afraid to realize that if you go out into the woods outside of society and all of its comforts, uh, nature 
doesn't actually care that you who you vote for for president. Nature doesn't care that you hug trees. It's going to afflict you with all kinds of diseases and the bugs are going to attack you and you have to fend for yourself because it's tough out there. You know, modern civilization is a great success story that humans can now live lives of physical comfort, but we don't remember what it was like to live in nature itself, which is actually quite cruel. Uh, as Schopenhauer once uh, observed, Schopenhauer said, um, okay. nature is like a mother who abandons her children immediately after birth. Okay, nature is not, it's not a loving mother. Nature is complicated like that. There's, there's the good and the bad, but the people don't look at the bad. Um, and, he, and if humans, and here's the other thing about that environmentalist ideology, I think it's in tension with itself, is if humans are nothing more than a product of nature, then that means that humans are nature, and so what is this idea that somehow whatever humans do is unnatural when humans are entirely a product of this thing? I mean, exactly. are, we, are we bringing in some metaphysical something from the air that's somehow making us really bad and all the other critters are fine? You know, where does that come from? It doesn't make any sense. I mean, every creature that evolved throughout history radically changed its environment, if you think about it. Yeah. Termites, bees, they, they all change their environment. That's what they do. And humans are just one of them. That's what we do too. Where, where, does, yep. where does this all this, this demonization of the human coming from? I don't, I don't understand it. <laughs> Weird. You know, I got what you said that you know, nature's a mother that's unloving and whatever, and, and, and demanded it's young. I think that she loved, you know, nature loves us, man. I think she, yes, she abandoned us, but she left us with, with air and water and food and meaning and sex, man. So, get after <laughs> it. You know, it's there. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that, that's kind of how I conceptualize the deist God is that just because the deist God doesn't, you know, cure my cancer, and I am a leukemia survivor, but I attribute that to science, right? But, you know, we're, we're in a field, you know, we're in a field of freedom, you know, and we're, we're able to live our lives in this field of freedom, and but we have to have real risks in order to be able to live a full human life. We can't live a full safe life that has no risk in it we have to be risk friendly and that's Nietzsche said really the same thing the, you know the best mm -hmm. life lived is the, a dangerous one yes. yes yes that's why you ride motorcycles that's why you smoke cigars <laughs> jump out of planes <laughs> yeah we take risks it, only risk can ever bring glory Anal sex all that stuff <laughs> ask the mouth <laughs> <laughs> That's the bourbon talking. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Mike. If we, if we really lived in a true communist utopia without any risk in our lives, I think that there would be a lot of romance lost. You know, a lot of boring. boring. Aesthetics would be lost. <laughs> a desiccated a cadaver. Yeah. Everyone it's gets a harp. It's, it's kind of a colorless life. You need to have real risks in your life. When everybody's yeah. great, no one's great. Yeah. There's a lot of truth in that. That's a lot of truth of that. <laughs> Mike, you bring a, a new found hope to me when it comes to the education system and college professors. Uh, I hope there are more out there like you. Well, if we look at the statistics, okay, there aren't many like me. <laughs> Bleak. <laughs> but I will tell you this. There are more than a lot of people might suppose. There are more. because. Yeah, I'm a little, I can be a little high profile sometimes, and I've gotten sort of connected with a lot of people. And they're, they don't agree with me on everything. Some of them might be Christians, some of them might be atheists, you know, this and that, and they're all around, but they are committed to the United States is awesome. Why, why do we want to, you know, mess it all up? And freedom is great, and individualism is great, and, and we just have a lot of fun. Sometimes we even get together and have lunches together and just enjoy each other's company so that we don't feel so alone. <laughs> But they are out there. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's good. Well, I'm thankful for all four of them. That's great, man. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can find them and put them on the show. There are more than four showing up. <laughs> well, Mike, we're going to want you to come back on because we've got uh, the you know the direction of the show that we're thinking and the guests we have lined up, man. Um, it's it's going to be it's going to be pretty good if everything comes to fruition. It's going to be pretty, pretty, uh, something talked about, you know, so yeah. we're going to definitely want you to come on and maybe, um, kind of riff with somebody else that might be kind of against what you're saying and, and sure, vice versa. Be yeah. Because, uh, 
I think that discussing things, I think talking about things, and I think ironing things out uh, helps people get a better understanding of each other and most importantly themselves. So, yeah, I mean that, that's the whole reason for the show, man. You know, taking these worldviews and different things and let's let's talk about it because communication is key. You know. Yep, absolutely. I don't want to take what someone else said about somebody and go, oh, re- oh, that's how it is. Oh, okay. Duh. You know. Um, yeah. Let's find out ourselves. Question all things. Yeah. Once I started hearing other people out and really starting to open up my mind to other people's views. Yeah. Uh, I just feel like I'm just much richer intellectually as a result, and I think a lot of people are being discouraged from ever, uh, ever even being friends with, uh, you know, someone with whom they disagree. Yeah. Or much less talking <laughs> about their ideas, you know, and that's, yeah. that's not right. That's that's anti-intellectual, and it yeah. limits the mind, and it puts the human in a cage. It's not not good. <laughs> Mike. Starting from a very, very young age for me, being yeah. told who I should listen to, who I should read, what music I should listen to, uh, and having that carried on throughout my adult life, and always questioning that. And every time I question that and cross that, that border and go talk to that individual that I was not supposed to talk to, I find that on the other side, there's some wisdom there that somebody didn't want me to know. Well, I, yeah. must, tell, I must tell you from my own experience, I have... I have sometimes on occasion gotten a hard time from talking to you guys, but I'm just like, you know, here's the deal. <laughs> it's like, you know, my, my life has been so enriched by talking to you guys and being in the same general region as John and so on. And yeah. I really have learned some really cool stuff. And I, yeah. I'm so glad I learned it. And I'm so glad I've experienced it. And yeah. The- gain a lot from talking to all kinds of different people and just being chill and you might yeah. be like wow that guy just made a really damn good point right there holy smokes yeah, yeah. i never imagine thought of that. that i never thought of that but it actually makes total sense to me right now you know that's kind of imagine that yeah <laughs> exactly. yeah mike those people that are saying that to you or giving you shit for that uh, they're just jealous they want to come on the show they want to talk to us too they do <laughs> that's right that's what this show is all about right <laughs> Mike, thank you for coming on, man. We're going to cut this off here. And uh, yeah, thank, thank you, you for watching. Thank you, sir. Thank yeah, you for having episode, me. Everyone. Yeah, absolutely, man. We'll see you again. Okay.